Hey everyone, I just wanted to go ahead and give you a warning about this week's episode. Uh, we are covering a documentary that has to deal with assisted suicide, dying with dignity. Uh, it's a very sensitive subject matter, which is why I wanted to go ahead and put a little warning up here up front. So if that's something you're not interested in or you think it might be a little triggering for you, feel free to skip this one. Um, but for those of you who are curious about uh, death with dignity uh, and the amazing work that's being done across this country um, to help those with terminal illnesses in their life in a more dignified and humane way, feel free to keep listening. Um, for a little bit of relevance, we're recording this episode um, about a little less than two weeks since the death of uh, George Floyd that has really shaken up the country and the world uh, and brought, you know, police brutality back into the limelight once again. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to let you all know ahead of time that this is going to be a heavy episode dealing with some very controversial topics uh, and some controversial opinions about suicide and dying with dignity. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, please keep listening. And if not, uh, we won't be offended or upset that you chose to bow out. And you can tune in next week for an episode that's probably going to be a lot more fun and lighthearted. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to say up front that the Silver Linings playlist does stand in alliance with any organization and any group that stands against oppression, racism, fascism, uh, homophobia, xenophobia, anything of like that, um, we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and uh, abolishing ICE, any agenda that will get rid of racism and all that, all the terrible things that it does. So yeah, like I said, this week's going to be a heavier episode. So uh, tune in and thank you for listening. Thank you for all your support over the years. Uh, we hope you stick around and stick with us through these difficult times. Um, hopefully we can get back to some semblance of normalcy in the upcoming months, uh, at least in terms of returning to work and being with our friends and family. And we won't have to be stuck inside uh, much longer, but we hope our, our podcast gives you some sense of levity and some sorts of entertainment because we know the world's a little scary right now and the times are a little dark. So hopefully we can make you laugh. We can make you think. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for listening. And here we go. Excuse us. No, pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Just move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. Okay, so we got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. This shit better be good. Let's hope so. Shh. I am Dustin Goes to Hollywood. I am so sad. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. Um, God damn. <laughs> you, pick, you picked one today, Dustin. I did. Uh, before we, we get into that... Why don't you, uh, while we, we play... are both, we are both eating during this episode. <laughs> that's, that's how you know we watch something <laughs> fucked up. Cause, yeah, we're both like sad eating right now. <laughs> I was gonna say, why don't we play a little game of what's Mally eating? I'm yeah. eating a chocolate bar. Mm hmm. Just a straight up chocolate bar. <laughs> <laughs> and I just finished, um, a bag of Cracker Jacks, which I have not had since I was, like, five. <laughs> hey, Cracker Jack, sponsor us. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, Thank you for tuning in, everyone, for another week of the Silver Linings Playlist. If you are new to our show, um, this is a bit uh, of... You know, we talked about this on... I forgot what movie it was, but something recently. We talked about... Um, when sitcoms in the 90s would do those special episodes um, mm -hmm. where they talk about heavy subject matters. This is one of those for our show. Um, I'm sure you've heard that. A little bit. <laughs> I'm sure you heard that tag up at the top of the show. Um, but 
in a more general sense, what we do on the show is we watch movies um, like the movie we're covering this week, the documentary How to Die an Organ, uh, and we try to find a little glimmer of hope, a little spark at the end of the movie where things seem down and, uh, you know, you seem like you can't win and things are just terrible. Uh, and we try to find some good in those things. Um, no, this is the first time we've done a documentary on this show. It is. And um, do you realize the Pandora's box you've opened for me? Yeah. I mean, we could just do the show on documentaries, honestly. Um, but so before we get too much into the documentary itself, um, I just wanted to kind of talk about the reason why we're doing this specific one as our first documentary uh, and why we're doing it now. So, uh, Mally, back when we first started this show, when I came to you and I said, hey, I have this idea for a podcast uh, where we can talk about movies, um, I wanted to do a show where I could just have an outlet to talk about movies, but... So I could rein myself in and I'm not just talking about every single movie I want to talk about. I put that, you know, little stickler of it's got to be a movie that doesn't end well. And it makes me watch the movie a little more intently, uh, a little more intensely to really appreciate it and try to find uh, something good in that. And, you know... This was one of those movies that I had in mind when we started the show. Um, I mean, the idea of the show is to have fun and talk about whatever it is we want to talk ah! about. <laughs> Even if it has nothing to do with the movie itself of the week. Um, I just wanted to have a way to talk about movies. Um, this episode, I'm not going to come out and say it's going to be a depressing episode we'll have fun like we usually do but uh well not maybe as extremely but you know we have this platform now like we're closing in on 100 episodes um and we've got you know a pretty decent fan base uh, at least a pretty decent listener base um so yeah they, they, they listen to it <laughs> they don't like us yeah uh but you know, I wanted to use it to talk about something that um, I've been extremely passionate about for years now. Um, and this movie fits that position perfectly. Um, and, you know, um, I'm pretty sure we'll have some hot takes, some controversial opinions. But, you know, if we lose a listener or two because of this episode, um, whether it's because it's just not funny or, or entertaining, um, or it's because people disagree with our philosophies, then so be it. I mean, I don't think we've ever catered or pandered to our audiences, and, you know, we've always said what we believed about certain subjects, so I'm not going to start that now. Um, yeah, including that time you defended the pedophile. That is not what happened. Go back. <laughs> Go back and re-listen to the Hard Candy episode way back in season one. <clears throat> I do not do that. <laughs> you, um, yeah, a little bit. Anyway. God damn it. I'm never going to get that. I'm never going to live that down. Oh, no. You're not living that down. Anyway. That's the, the preface. <laughs> Why the one we... of us that has kids was defending pedophiles. <laughs> was not defending. <laughs> Choose your words carefully. I was not defending pedophiles. Well. No. That's not what okay. happened. Anyway, I hope to God this is not the first episode someone listens to. Because holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> anyway. So, this was your first time seeing this documentary, right? Yeah. I didn't know what this was. <laughs> Dustin, I went into this knowing the title. Yeah. Nothing else. I didn't know what the fuck it was about. I didn't know... I had no idea yeah. what this was. 
And I'm so fucking mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you really mad at me, though? Like, a little bit, because as I mentioned on last week's episode... You watched, watched this back to back. The Lighthouse yeah. and this back to back. Well, I will Woo. say this has got to be like top contender for the show, though, right? Like this perfectly fits into the criteria for oh, our show. It fits. So, but God, if damn you're it. not familiar with this documentary, "How to Die in Oregon" from 2011. Uh, is uh, an HBO documentary uh, that deals with what's Wait, called side side thing. Uh huh. I couldn't. I I did have to rent it, which was annoying. <laughs> oh, because okay. it's I'm an sorry. HBO documentary, but it is not on HBO. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I sent you a, a link to watch it, but maybe you I probably did, and I probably forgot. <laughs> well, if you're Either not familiar. Way. With. It was three dollars. I'm not exactly breaking the bank there, yeah. but I just think it's really funny that it's an HBO documentary that you can't watch. That's on HBO. very true. I do remember looking on that's, HBO to see if I could find it. That's funny to me. Yeah, I couldn't find like, it on HBO. Really? So. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I checked HBO um, now, HBO Max, yep. like HBO, Go- like it's not on HBO. <laughs> no, it's not. Which is so weird. Um, but anyways, the movie itself has to deal with. It's called. The Death with Dignity uh, Act. So basically, the idea is that in certain states, Oregon being one of them, uh, it is legal for people that have been diagnosed with terminally ill diseases uh, can choose to end their own life with prescribed medication. So essentially, a doctor approves this um, approves this medication. The patient can then choose when they want to use it. So essentially deciding what day they want to end their lives. Um, it's a very, obviously very controversial topic, um, but it does give those people that know that they have uh, a very soon expiration date to choose when to take their own lives. So they have that dignity of you know, choosing not to go through chemotherapy or choosing not to be uh, a quote-unquote burden on their family in their time of a very slow demise. They can choose to go out still feeling on top of things. Um, And the movie focuses mostly on uh, the character, or should I say the real person, Cody Curtis, um, who is a woman that gets diagnosed with a very specific cancer um and we the documentary follows her from the time she's been diagnosed until the time that she does ultimately decide to take this medication that is uh a very humane a humane way to to uh to end your life they briefly talk about the medication um it essentially puts you into a coma and lets you fade away from there um so, Mally, I know this was your first time seeing it, and you went in blind, and you went in having just watched The Lighthouse, which doesn't end too well either. Um, yeah. What's, what's your gut reaction to this movie? Um. So, because this is, like, because it was our first documentary... Mm-hmm. And because of how much you kind of like built it up, I sat down with a notepad to take notes on this film. Yeah. I okay. took zero. Yeah. Because I just like from the opening segment, I was yeah. just like sitting there like slumped over on my couch, just like jaw agape, just like, yeah. what the fuck? Yeah. Am I watching? And like, I don't, I just, I was just fucking like in, like I couldn't break away to like take notes, to like check my phone, like nothing. I was just like fucking sitting there just like, oh shit. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, <laughs> That's the first much time. How I, set through the whole fucking thing <laughs> the the first time i saw this movie i think i was probably 
it would have been right around the time it was released, I think. So, like, it came out in 2011, so I would have been uh, 21. I think I saw it then. And I don't even remember how I came across it. I remember just I, – I was intrigued by the title. I think a friend actually recommended it to me. Um, but kind of the same situation, like, in that cult opening where we're following – the final moments of Roger Sagner, um, you know, take this medication and die in the arms of his family. It's incredibly difficult to pull yourself away from like this a little movie, bit. This movie is incredible just as a movie, but then the fact that it's real people and you're watching their real lives and, you know, also watching those real lives come to an end it's you know it's i i can't we're going to play the trailer in a little bit i can't imagine anyone seeing that trailer and in it not at least piquing your interest or same thing with the cold opening as you you know had to experience like seeing that cold opening and it not immediately pulling you in i can't imagine um but why don't we talk about um, a little behind the scenes of the movie first? So, as I mentioned, the year is 2011. Uh, the director is Peter Richardson. Uh, in the film, I hesitate, stars Cody Curtis because these are real people. Um, but yeah, I don't think that's the appropriate yeah, uh, yeah. nomenclature there. I would say it mainly focuses on Cody Curtis as well as. Uh, Nancy, and I unfortunately can't pronounce her last name, um, but her story, as well as a few others. Uh, the budget was seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. The you know it's an HBO documentary, so there's not really a way to determine how successful it was financially. Um, but the film does sit currently at a one hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, and Holy it was, shit, really? Yes, I, I think that's mostly, not to take away from the movie, but I think that's mostly from a lack of reviews. I think there's only a handful. Uh, but it was awarded the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. Um, <clears throat> So like I said, this movie is a very heavy subject um and if you've made it this far and you're still unsure whether or not you really want to get into it um we're gonna play the trailer you'll get to hear kind of a little bit of what it's about uh and get the gravity of things and if you still want to continue power through it if not we won't fault you for bowing out of uh of this episode but here we go let's watch the trailer for how to die in oregon Hey, cool. I finally get to see the trailer for it, at least. Yeah. Before you take the medication, I'm going to ask you just two questions again. Sure. You have the right to change your mind. My mind's not changing. And what will this medication do? It will kill me and make me happy. Jesus. Yeah. Death with dignity. The other side calls it assisted suicide. I was diagnosed with cancer. I was supposed to have six months. It's this curious limbo. You don't know what's really going to happen. Except with death with dignity, you do have some control over what's going to happen. First you know harm is going to be different for every patient. Harm for some patients is saying, no, 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 you've got to do this the way your body decides as opposed to the way you decide. My son has a little trouble with this. She says the cancer's come back and things are going to be fine. That sounds like the opposite of fine. If I'm in that bed and I'm racked up with a stroke, that's what I want. That's the decent thing to do. So for once in my life, I'll be decent. <laughs> <laughs> if I had an option, I would prefer not to die. Thank you very much. The Oregon law has been thoroughly tested. Now it's time to get it going in other states. I just think a society has to be asked, is this what we really want? My husband did not feel that any government or any religious leader had the right to tell him how long he had to suffer. I understand that 
there's a kind of dignity in suffering, but there's a certain grace in accepting the inevitable. I, I can't do any more. I think all of us would like to have some options of how we'd take control of our life at the end. So, like I said, if that trailer doesn't pique your interest, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but I'm sad all over again. <laughs> Why don't we, because the way I did, I took my notes is I broke this up into a couple of different sections where there's the movie itself, there's the story of Cody and the story of Nancy. Um, we can, I think we should save Cody for last because she's the bulk of, of everything. Yeah, I agree. Why don't we actually talk about that cult opening that you mentioned, Roger Sagner. So this is how we're st- introduced to what this movie is even about so i mean his dude like the most like the thing that fucking like got me like got my jaw to drop the line was in the trailer where he's like what is this gonna do to you and he's like it's gonna kill me and make me happy and i was like fucking what yeah i mean (laughs) the the fact that he's the reason they asked him that uh, is as they explained in the movie to make sure that these people are still coherent enough to know that this medication they're about to take will kill them. And yeah, he says it so bluntly. He's just like, it will kill me and make me happy. And it's not the most uplifting thing to hear, but it certainly, I think, the point of this whole debate about the legality and the morality of assisted suicide or death with dignity, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it's the perfect jumping off point. Um, Mally, you don't, if you feel like you don't want to share your thoughts on this, that's totally fine. But something that, again, the whole reason I wanted to do this episode on this show is because I have been a huge advocate for death with dignity for a long time. Um, and I have a somewhat funny story to talk about later, um, in relation to that, but interesting, (laughs) uh, that's a a promise for some entertainment in the future. (laughs) Um, Okay. But, uh, you know, I had felt this way even before seeing this movie that the stigma surrounding ending one's own life is just ridiculous to me the usual adage is that taking your own life is selfish in that you leave other people behind to grieve and miss you and you know all these other kind of guilt trips that people put on but this movie alone i think is evidence enough that there's sh- i mean the movie the act itself is called death with dignity. I think there is a dignified way to go about those things. I think the real selfish uh, stigma about suicide is the idea that someone who is in a lot of physical or emotional pain sticking around simply because they don't want to be looked at as a coward, you know, that's, that's the one scene in this movie that really sticks out to me um, Mm -hmm. when Cody's talking about how she feels bad because even though she has this cancer and her doctors are saying she's going to die, that she doesn't feel sickly for the majority of this movie. She says, I don't feel bad, but I feel bad emotionally and mentally that people may think I'm faking or that, oh, you don't look like a sick person. And she's afraid that, you know, if she were to expose herself to that, that it would make her a coward that, right. You know, that that's the one scene I've only seen this movie twice and it fucking destroys me every time. Um, it's perfectly summarizes exactly what's wrong. I think with, the the notion that suicide is selfish i mean it's plain as simple as i can make it that's where i stand on it i think it's ridiculous to burden people with your emotions of their mm-hmm. pain pretty much 
Um, you know, I had he he wasn't a family member, but I did have uh, an acquaintance that I knew who took their own life uh, when I was a teenager in a very violent way. Um, I mean, and it's a cliche to say, but it does really change how you see things and how it changes a community. I mean, this was a guy who was very popular in the music scene in my hometown uh, and has since become kind of a legend in that sense. But one thing I will say is no one ever was angry that he died. There was never that sense of he took his own life. What about me kind of thing, which is the real irking part to me about, you know, the results of someone's death. So, you know, watching Cody go through what she goes through in this movie, it's, I'm glad that at, by the end, she's made peace with everything before she does uh, eventually decide to take this medication. But it's really, you know, the first half of this movie kind of feels like smooth sailing for her. And then when it finally does hit the reality of the situation, it's the last like 30 minutes are really some of the most upsetting thing I've ever seen. So, I mean, that's. That's just where I stand on it. I, I I can't stand when people say that of, you know, this person took their own life. It was a selfish act, blah, blah, blah. I just, I can't stand that. So, like I said, I don't know how you feel about it. If you don't want to share, that's fine. <laughs> but, again, that's kind of the no, main reason I, mean, I wanted I'm, to talk about this movie. I'm pretty much right there with you. Um, I you know, kind of agree with all your points. Um, I too know someone that, you know, took their own life and it was the same. No one was like, you know, called them selfish or anything like that. Um, you know, they were sad, but they weren't like, oh, that selfish motherfucker, nothing like that. Um, yeah, dude. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, you, you kind of covered a lot of it, but yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a hard thing to deal with. And, you know, I do think in that situation, you know, you I think it's completely within your rights to have that option, you know? Um, yeah. That being said, one thing I do want to talk about, like one of the scenes that scenes, one of the moments that really like fucked with me was, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but the, it kind of looks like a uh, methed out Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah, I know um, you're talking about. I can't where, remember his name either. Yeah, where he, he's uh like pretty much pissed, like he's angry that like they pretty much like they're like we can't offer you chemotherapy, but we can offer you death with dignity. Mm -hmm. And he kind of goes off in that little tangent. He's like, you know, they won't help me, but they'll volunteer to kill me. Yeah. And that, I don't know, just that little, like, line really fucked me up. Um, and then, you know, cut to black, and then the, tie, like, the font on the screen is, like, after, you know, he made his opinion public about that, like, pretty much, like, you know, he said that, and they then did offer him the chemotherapy, and he died from cancer anyway. Yeah. Um, like, that little, like, it's a very short little moment in the overall documentary but like it really fucked me up for a second there like i didn't pause it but i was very like kind of missed the next like 30 seconds because i was like fuck like oh my god like because that well that is one like while i agree with the death with dignity like that bit was a little fucked up whether like they wouldn't offer him medical care but they did offer him death with dignity which i was like okay like maybe rule out the other options first yeah <laughs> what's well, it's it comes down to to money it's much cheaper to True. i mean they even say in the beginning of this movie that this medication only costs 89 dollars like 89 dollars that's all it cost to humanely kill yourself that's it and you know, chemotherapy is tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, true, 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 true. It is upsetting that they offer him that, you know, you have two options, you know, either 
take the death with dignity or don't. And unfortunately, like by the time he does get his chemotherapy, it's too late. Like it's that little segment is so upsetting just because it's so quick. It's just a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of the movie. Like you meet that that man, I can't remember his name unfortunately, but you meet him, learn about his situation, and then within ten minutes he's dead. And that's the only little glimpse of him you get to know. They do something similar with um the voice actor. Um, I can't remember his name as well, unfortunately, but you know, he goes to a recording studio and records his own eulogy and then he he dies and they do play f- for his family at his funeral. But, I mean, these are all people that either can't afford the treatment or have gone through the treatment and physically just can't do it again. I had, um, when I was younger, um, like eight or nine, I did go to church and the pastor of the church's wife had cancer and, um, survived and it came back and she was like, I just can't do it again. And ultimately she died. And I mean, that's the, like, let's talk about Nancy. Cause this perfectly segues into what I want to talk about. So the, the, I hate calling him the character, the, um, segment of the movie talking about Nancy. She is essentially, uh, the surviving widow of, uh, a man that died, um, from cancer and basically asked her to ensure that anyone that wanted to die with dignity with the death with dignity act had that opportunity. So basically asking her to campaign and champion for this to get passed, uh, in Oregon. And there's, you know, she tells about her whole story with how he was sick and, you know, how that was like his dying wish was to have her help as many people as possible. And when she's on in the park and she's just handing out flyers and wanting to talk to people about passing this proposed bill to allow death with dignity in uh, their state. And there's that guy that's like, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. Um, I, I should talk some sense into you or whatever. And she even invites him to. She's like, well, why don't we? Why don't we sit down and talk about it? And he just keeps walking. And, you know, there's that old adage of you don't know everyone's story that you meet on the street. But the fact that anyone could look her in the eyes after what she and her husband went through and be like, no, my beliefs say you can't do this is absurd. Like, when you see the religious protesters saying that no one is allowed to take their lives because that's what they believe in, it's ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. And none of these people even take the chance to talk to her, even when given the opportunity. And it's just so, so ridiculous. I mean, thank God uh, the bill does get passed. And, you know, seeing her take the stage after it got passed and announcing that her marriage is now officially over. It wasn't over when her husband died. It was over when she got this bill passed. It's, it's almost as heartbreaking as any of the actual deaths that we see in this movie, just her coming to peace and finally yeah. me, I'm going to put her husband to rest. It's, it's a tough watch, man, but I, I'm so happy that, she was able to get that done. And I hope more <laughs> states adopt this ideology um, throughout the years. I don't know yeah, exactly what? what the numbers are right now. I was saying, do, you, do you know what states um, what states this is currently legal in, like as of 2020? Yeah, I'm going to actually look that up right now. States that allow assisted death. And this is actually on the deathwithdignity.org website. Um, huh. So currently the states that do allow this are uh well washington dc uh california colorado hawaii maine new jersey oregon vermont and washington so only eight states well uh one two three four five six seven, eight states and then dc so you know a small percentage uh and it looks like the most recent one 
Uh, there's a couple. Hawaii, Maine, and New Jersey all legalized it in 2019. So we're still making headway on it. Huh. Um, I think it's ridiculous that not all 50 states haven't adopted this policy. It's so easy to just be on the right side of things with this. But, <sighs> yeah, that's that's where we're at. Um, So I do... I, to give some breath of levity in this, I do have a funny story to tell uh, regarding this. So in film school, the school we were both I'm all, to. I'm all ears. It's, just, it's for something funny. Um, in film school, uh, we had to take a public speaking class. Uh, I don't know if you had to take it as well, but it was something we had to do in my I program. did, I did, I did. So one of the speeches, of course, is the um, persuasive speech where you present a topic and try to persuade your listeners to side with you pretty much in your arguments. Um, and I, uh, did a speech about suicide and I, Holy shit, Dustin. (laughs) So, but let me finish. So, uh, this is a class of about, it was a huge class, probably about a hundred kids. And our professor was this really upbeat, nothing can ever go wrong kind of guy, like always had a smile on his face, even in the most <laughs> troubling times. Um, but I, so I get up there. Uh, I start my speech by talking about statistics. Pretty much. I I'm like, you know, X amount of people die every year from car crashes, X amount of people die every year from heart disease, whatever. And I start talking about the statistics for suicide and, my teacher is in the audience just looking at me smiling with a thumbs up like, you're doing great. Um, and <laughs> I remember the moment things changed was uh, the last line of my – one of the last lines of my introduction was, this is not a speech about suicide prevention. And I instantly saw the life <laughs> drain out of this dude's face. <laughs> um, and – Luckily, everyone in the room was really respectful for, you know, 100 plus college kids. I was expecting some kind of backlash. But basically, my whole speech was this movie that there is this idea, this organization, Death with Dignity. Here's what they stand for. Here's why it's so easy to just be on the side of allowing these people to have dominion over their own lives. And I even played... The clip that we talked about where Cody's talking about the stigma of looking like a coward for choosing to take this this medication. And I just remember like the the room shifting completely after that. And <laughs> I went over my time for my speech, because that clip is about two minutes long. Um but you know How long uh, was this speech total? Uh, I think we had to be under 10 minutes and I was at like 12, but I had to play that scene because it just completely solidified. And basically at the end of it, I was just like, look, you could be against suicide as a generality. No one's saying people should do this. No one's saying I want people (laughs) to kill themselves. I'm just saying those people that want to, that have a right to should be allowed to do that without suffering from the stigma of it being selfish or cowardly, etc. And somehow those hundred plus kids, at least in that moment, I won them over. I was really surprised <laughs> I didn't get into a fight that day. Um but yeah, I just I just thought it was funny. It's just if you would have seen this professor, just how white, pale white he became after that, but yeah. I think it might have been the same guy I had. <laughs> oh, this guy, his personality just stuck out. He was never in a bad like that, mood. Like real, yeah, real bubbly and shit. Yep. Yeah, I think I had that guy. <laughs> um, But it's so interesting because as huh. much as this movie, like, is a huge part of my personality and, like, represents something that I'm so passionate about... You know, there's that notion that people say, oh, I've watched this movie and one time is all I needed. You know, some people say that about Requiem for a Dream. I've only seen it once because that's I'm one and done. Uh, 
that's this movie for me. Like, in fact, as well versed as I am in it, this is only the second time I've seen it. Uh, and even on this rewatch, knowing what's going to happen, it's I, I still found myself just choked up and, you know, because. Let, let, let's get into Cody because Cody is. Oh, the, God. <laughs> Cody is the central figure in this movie and she's such a sweet woman she is she is a godsend this is the most gentle loving caring person i've ever met like it's all she's almost not even real like she's so caring and sympathetic and loving and nurturing and yeah it's it's a face that again i've only seen this movie twice now I cannot get out of my mind. Like her voice, her face, her smile, I it it's burned into my memory I just, forever. I just want to take a minute. This is like your Devil's Not episode. <laughs> yes. Yes, like, 100%. Cuz anyone anyone that knows me knows how passionate and crazy and rambling I get about the West Memphis 3. The, your this is this is your West Memphis 3, Dustin. Oh, I mean, I Cuz I've said a total of 20 words this whole episode. <laughs> well, and to be and fair, I fine cuz to be honest, I don't have a ton to say because it's still a little fresh for me like I can't yeah. form words. Yeah. Um so I'm ha- more than happy to let you talk, but I just wanted to point out that, <laughs> that was just a observation to to lighten the mood again before we get into sure. this really dark thing. Um, yeah, I mean just to lighten I... the mood. This is your West Memphis 3. <laughs> and I'm reining it in pretty heavily like if i really wanted to i could go almost like a televangelist about this subject but i'm trying to be as uh, approachable as possible See, but now you know how i feel about the devil's not episodes <laughs> i'm honing back a lot here just so you know listener um but yeah cody curtis i i love her so much man Eve, like one scene that sticks out to me about just how much of a kind, intelligent, sweet person this was when intelligent? she is. Did I say intelligent? <laughs> I'm getting choked up. Intelligent and caring person she was. Um, there's the scene where she is um, with the surgeons and they're removing all the fluid. Uh, God damn it. The fluid from her. You're doing great, buddy. <laughs> uh, they're removing all the fluid from her lungs that are just filling up and even in that moment oh that scene was gross it's it's a gross scene but the part that really solidifies her as like this gentle person is even as they're being in all that pain and being so loopy as she is she's so charming in telling the surgeons to pat themselves on the back and to have a group yeah. hug <laughs> like she's in that moment, like if this was a movie and not a documentary of real people, you know, that would play off as cheesy or she would appear weak. But, you know, she just had like liters and liters of fluid pumped out of her body and she's in so much pain. Yeah, I think they said like like three big ass bottles. Like two liter bottles. Like three yeah, of them. Like yeah. three of them. Yeah. And that, oh. she, that she smiles and tells them to pat themselves on the back that they could, did a good job and have a group hug. Like well, and that's, even like the doctor shows her one of the bottles and like I can't remember what exactly she says, but she's like pretty much is like, oh that's crazy. Yeah, like so <laughs> calm and collected. I'm just like, what? Yeah. The fuck. I mean, she is such a strong figure for this movie. Like she is. I can, I see why they made her the central character or the central focus of this documentary because yeah. it is impossible to not like her. Even if you don't agree with the Death with Dignity Act, she is a a beacon of personality and charming. She's she's one of the most wonderful people that has ever walked this earth. Um, and it's, you know, when we do get to those scenes... Um, where we're unfortunately having to see her go through this very painful and traumatic experience when she's, you know, finally showing cracks um, in this illness that she has. It is, 
it's really tough to watch. I mean, the last act of this movie where the, the cancer is in full effect uh, and she's bedridden and she's trying to teach her son this this cookie recipe, I think it was. Um, and you can just hear the belabored breathing. Um, it's Now, I will say that is around the point where I started cursing your father fucking name Dustin. because you knew we were because doing it for the show I knew, because we were doing it for the show i knew where in that moment i knew where it was headed and i was like oh dustin you son of a fucking bitch because <laughs> again after spending like an hour or so watching her just being so fucking great yeah and like that moment where it really you really start to see that oh it's like you can see her getting more sick. I was like, no, like I'm like, I'm fighting back tears. I'm like, Oh, Dustin, you son of a bitch, <laughs> Dustin, you motherfucker. Oh, yeah. you, oh, you fucking son of a bitch. Yeah. Oh, I've never been more fucking angry with you. <laughs> Swear to God. Um, and, and, and you've defended pedophiles on our show. God and damn this it. Pissed no, me I off haven't. more. We have got to stop. <laughs> Stop this before some bad shit can spread about. <laughs> oh, oh, you've already you've already made a list. Uh, see past you're on some candy. kind of list. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if there was ever a movie that uh, I would recommend our listeners watch before they listen to our show, like you know, usually we say watch it before so we don't spoil things for you. But even if you just just want to listen to this episode, I implore you to seek this documentary out and watch it. Just even knowing how it ends, because we're going to get there, but you have to, at least for yourself, do yourself the favor of experiencing the joy that is an hour and a half of the most beautiful, charming, uh, sweet, soft-spoken woman that I think has ever existed. I mean... For someone, you know, my mom had cancer at one point, and luckily she was strong Bastard enough. Mine. She was strong enough to beat it, and your mother as well. Um, you know, when she's dealing with all this stuff, and she has a line that really stuck out with me, and it's just because you're going to die doesn't mean you're going to solve everything wrong in your life. Like mm -hmm. death with dignity gives these people the option to go through a checklist of here's all the things I want to do before I die. And she mentions that she does that list very quickly. And then she says she doesn't feel bad. And she's upset about that because, you know, she did her essentially her bucket list of getting things prepared for her and her family for when she does go. And she's still there. And she knows like, I think even the line comes around when she's talking about her parents, that she wants her parents mm -hmm. there on the day that she does die. Um, and we don't ever get to see her parents. But, you know, I thought that was just like the hardest hitting line of the entire film. Like the amount of wisdom yeah. she's able to exhume while going through this really devastatingly traumatic experience is just another reason why this – person this this character of cody curtis just is long-standing and hasn't left my mind since i first saw this movie um i think genuinely if people were on the opposite side of this argument to just sit down and hear her story and watch what she went through i think you'd be hard pressed to argue against allowing people to uh decide when it's time for them to go you know um, well, I want to save the ending for when we get there, because there's a lot to talk about. Um, oh, Jesus. Let's jump back real quick to, um, uh, Roger Sagner, that cold opening, because it is very quick and we don't really come back to him much, but, you know, that's how we first get introduced to this idea of death with dignity and what it looks like. And it's, there's, there's just something off-putting um to me about the the doctor that is speaking with roger at the beginning um Why? you know it's well this is the first scene of the movie like this is how we're getting introduced to this idea of quote-unquote 
assisted suicide. Um, and she's kind of addressing the room about what's about to happen in a very, I don't know. There's just something about her demeanor where it seems like this is like an everyday thing for her, which maybe it is, but this is literally like one of the most profound things that this family is ever going to experience. Uh, and you know, maybe it's just me, but it's almost like she's doing rounds like with medical students, you know, they go to each room saying, okay, here's what this person is experiencing. Here's what we're going to do for them, blah, blah, blah. And there's a man sitting there that's literally going to be dead in 10 minutes and knows it's coming and is choosing to have that happen. Um, I mean, that's not to talk despairingly about the doctor. It's just, it's a very surreal way to get into this movie and what the subject matter is going to be about. I mean, I don't know, maybe just give that opening scene and rewatch real quick, but it is a very odd tone for that room. Even the, like the whole family, um, they're just kind of gather around like it's just any other day and far be it from me to tell people how to grieve, but it's just, it's kind of a weird way into this movie. Not that I have a problem with it. I just, something I pointed out on this rewatch that I didn't remember so much from the first time I saw this movie. Um, hmm. but yeah, like Roger too, like we're not with him very long, but there's like little to no fanfare when Roger does die. Like, I mean, I don't know. It's very just, <laughs> just kind of, it just kind of happens. Yeah. I, I think even <laughs> one family member, like after he's 